one of the reasons that politicians engage in sort of this very uh, negative engaged in, and often in evoking anger and fear in campaigns is because it has proved to be a productive way to get people to vote for them. We have to reject that kind of campaign and, and support candidates that are willing to sort of allow us to, to be the democracy that we want to believe, or at least the one that, you know, whoever you are watching this feels it should be. So you have to engage and you have to be, you know, part of that change that you'd like to see around you. Work politics. Do you trust that anyone is looking after your interest? Today on episode 17 of The Silent Struggle, we want to discuss and take a look at public opinion and mental health. What does polling tell us? I am Robert Asensio. And next to me is retired police chief David Magnuson. Welcome, David. How you doing? Good deal. Good, good. So we are joined today by the Associate Dean of Research and Creative Activities of the Dorothy F. Schmidt College of Arts and Letters at Florida Atlantic University, Dr. Kevin M. Wagner. Welcome, doctor. How are you? I'm well. How are you guys? Doing, doing good. Doing good. Okay. So um, I know that FAU released a recent poll where you guys delved into um, taking a look at the Florida voters, what their sentiment is on the political landscape, how they feel about the people that are elected to represent them. Can we get right into it? So uh, typically we take a look at uh, uh, what, you know, the, the interest that people have and, and what's motivating them to participate in the political system. Um, this particular time around, we did something a little bit different. We, uh, we did all of the normal things like who are you going to vote for? Do you intend to vote? Um, you know, what are the big issues? But we also added a, a couple of outside questions just to sort of get uh, a little bit of picture of, uh, of what the people are thinking. And, and the one that stood out to me, and I, I suspect the one that stood out to you, is the personality trait uh, that people most value in a presidential candidate. And, uh, and, and we gave a, a few different options, integrity, leadership, empathy, intelligence, stability. Um, and I had no real prediction about how it would turn out. Um, but I, I think there's a larger story here, not from what people chose, and, and they chose leadership and integrity as their two top picks, but what they didn't choose, um, stability and particularly empathy. Um, and in a, in a universe where we increasingly see such a hostile political environment, people yelling and screaming at each other and not bothering to even try to understand another person's point of view, the lack of empathy, I think, is uh, is really indicative of uh, of where we are as a society right now. Very interesting. You know, I, I looked at at the uh, at the poll, the integrity. I don't have a problem with that being number one, it, but it it is kind of funny in looking at the rest of the poll and putting it together. It, integrity being that important. How does one define integrity then? Now, I know if you're a person of integrity, somewhere, you know, trailing not too far behind may be a sense of apathy. Uh, and overall, the whole conglomerate would lead to sound leadership. Uh, but yeah, that made a lot of sense. What jumped out at me, and it, it's certainly not to be political because that's not the realm we're going here, but 9%, 9.4% chose not to vote. Uh, I read that in the poll. And that to me is the thing, Democrat, Republican, independent, fair across the board. You gotta vote. I mean, if, if you don't if you don't want to vote, then you really don't have much to complain about or or praise to that extent. You know, you 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 ride the you ride the tide when things are good and you complain when it's bad, but well, who did you vote? Well, we were well, I didn't vote. So that that yeah. stood out to almost ten percent, which was very, very interesting. But that that is a good poll. But go on. I'm sorry. I just I just wanted to chime in on that because that was a very no. interesting part of your polling yeah I mean, it's a good point i think it has something to do with the fact that um, um the modern political universe turns off a certain number of people which is they look at it they see the hostility they see the hate they see the yelling when you watch it on television there's somebody waving a sign and yelling at somebody else or pushing somebody else and sometimes we see even uh, violence associated with it and for for a certain number and not an insignificant number of people that's you know you know they don't want to engage in that they don't want to participate in that and so they tap out but i, I think you're 100 percent right um if the people that want civil politics 
don't engage in politics and don't participate and don't vote for candidates that represent their values, then those candidates will be absent from leadership. And, uh, and then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy to some degree. We, the, the, our politics is a reflection of our choices. And, uh, and at some point, you know, not choosing is a choice. Also, going back into the weeds a little bit, there was a part with the Israel conflict with Palestine. And one thing that jumped out at me was 26 percent said uh, it was, you know, which side neither or don't know. Uh, don't know. I mean, then that's that's sort of indicative of what is going on around the world. Uh, there's there's an apathy there and there is a or or an ignorance or both you don't know you have no opinion and that 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 was kind of that's that's one out of four basically a little over one out of four which jumped out at me uh but here's where like we we swing back a little bit into the uh mental health aspect here and i gotta tell you out front i'm a baseball man baseball and boxing diehard cardinals fan so i'm a man of stats now i also know that statistics are a lot like a uh like a lamppost for a drunken sailor. They're more about alum, uh, for support than they are about illumination. It's what you make of the stats. And I get that. But, you know, I, I did some research and there was a great study, uh, an article that came out. And I have to, so I don't forget, elections have health consequences, depression, anxiety, and the 2020 presidential election that came out in 22 from the University of Nevada. And one of the quotes that jumped out is elections are a contest that often bring out dormant conflict, especially in the presence of aggressive or divisive candidates. So that was very interesting. And, and I bring that now into the that's in the past, bring it into the present with your poll. Your poll can be a, like a bit of an indicator, a barometer of maybe where we're going. Who, who's going to be the next study that comes out maybe after the next election to talk about the 2024 election? Because as things are shaping up now and based on previous uh, stories, previous uh, uh, doctorates, so to speak, uh, it's, it's, it does make sense that somewhere along the way, this is maybe going to be the most contentious election in our history. Um, and the polling and, and some of the things that come out of your polling seem to indicate it. You know, I may be a stretch to say it's going to happen. You know, you can't predict the future per se, but it's a pretty good indicator. So I guess your poll is is a barometer of current actions, right? So for the purpose or in the benefit of the audience, where can they find your poll so they can reference where we're talking it, what we're talking about here? Dr. Oh, sure, that's, a, that's, a, that's always a good question to ask. Um, since we're a public university, uh, everything that we produce is uh, uh, is is published and uh, and open, so you can see it. Uh, but uh, you can just Google the uh, FAU. Polcom, P-O-L-C-O-M lab, and uh, and it'll come up pretty easily. It's posted on the uh, Arts and Letters, that's our college's website, so uh, it's relatively easy to find. It's a long URL, so I don't want to bore your audience okay. with it, but it's easily found. So, so coming back to to mental health and and where people are at, right? So, so we see, look, life is difficult. We often say it here in in on the show. I heard you on the Manny Munoz show on WIOD 610 uh, talking about this, the, your findings. But what struck me was the fact that, that there were some callers they, they called in and they shared their sentiment about how, where they were at. You mentioned tapped out, checked out on their, their, their trust level of, of elected officials, right? So, so that is playing heavy in people's minds is no one's out there working for us. And, and I wanted to ask you, can you assess whether the checking out is of the point where they're just done or they're looking for, meaning the, the Floridians who were polled, they're looking for better alternatives and they would be receptive to better alternatives. People, candidates that would be working for them what what's the, what's the sense yeah so um there's a there's a bigger narrative here and it's a it's a it's a more complex story uh, um the united states as a country has miserable turnout compared to other countries worldwide in other words the percentage of our voters that turn out in any given election is relatively low comparatively speaking um and there's a lot of research and work into why that is so uh, and some of that is driven by sort of the negativity associated with a lot of our politics. Some of it is driven by the fact that we have so many elections compared to other countries. 
I mean, if you think about in your local community, how many times there's an election um, and, uh, um, and sort of the way that we design our system. Um, and in some places, voting is mandatory. So <laughs> it turns out that that actually helps turn out as well. Uh, we also don't make it necessarily easy, right? Voting is on a Tuesday, which is a work day. Um, we're, you know, trying to, to make it harder for people to vote by mail right now, which turned, you know, which actually helped increase turnout a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, so, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of different ingredients into this uh, this uh, explanation about why our turnout is relatively low. Um, our highest level of turnout does tend to be presidential elections, and and there you can get about you know sometimes about 60 percent, uh, sometimes a little bit more of registered voters to turn out, and that's pretty good. In a municipal election, which you know I'll argue for many people, it might be more important than the presidential election because it affects the, the the laws and rules and. Uh, and and the community that they're living in, uh, you know, you can get turnout 20 percent, 15 percent, which is you know striking, uh, considering how important uh, a city council or even a county commission can be uh, in uh, in your in your life. Uh, but uh, but turnout, yeah, it's uh, it's not great. Um, but you know, and some of that also, you know, just to throw in another reason, some of it it is a strategy, right? If you're a politician who can can never get a majority of the voters to vote for them for any number of reasons, um, you don't have to, as long as you make sure that the opposition is so disgusted or unhappy or, you know, fed up with the system or pox on both their houses that they don't turn out in sufficient numbers while your voters are energized enough to actually turn out and then you get to win. Because remember, it's it's not the, the person who gets the majority of the eligible voters, it's the person who gets the majority of the people that actually vote. So if you get your voters out there and the opposition's voters or people who are potentially voting for the opposition, you know, are, are saying, you know what, I don't want to participate, then you get to win. That's how it works. Yeah, and that's played very heavy in the media. We recently had a couple of media personnel, including Manny Munoz, uh, who shared with us that opinion media um, is not necessarily the news, yet a good percentage of the, those viewers believe in opinion media and what is being said. Well, it's the norm. Yeah, It's the norm, so they, they don't know any differently, uh, by and large. You know, going back to the study I talked about before, just, just to add a little bit and sway back over into the mental health issue, that same study, actually, it was the American uh, Psychological Association said in September 20, the source of stress in this election uh, whatever, however they put that together, was 68% of all Americans in the, after this last election. In 2016, it was 52%. Now, wherever, whatever you believe in the numbers or not, as far as that goes and how they put that together, it still showed a market increase from 16 to 20. And with the polling that's going on and what you hear, whether it's by legitimate journalists or it's by what we call the opinion makers, uh, one would have to, if you were in Vegas, put money down and say that number's probably going to climb in 2024. I don't see it receding. And there yeah, it goes. I, I don't either. With, and, health, with the mental health issues. Yeah. Yeah, I don't either. And uh, and I think part of it, I, I, I've written a fair amount about this. I wrote a book called Tweeting to Power uh, about the role of social media in, in politics and, and political participation. Um, for anyone that wants to read an academic book, Oxford University Press. Um, but... Um, part of the big problem that we have as a society uh, right now is that we live in our own information universes um, and the, uh, the what happens is that we become sort of engaged in that universe where we where everything we hear is on one side of the spectrum it repeats itself and it reinforces our belief structure and then when we run across somebody who disagrees with us instead of sort of having and going back to the basic empathy right let me understand their perspective we tend to reject it and go, how can anyone believe what they believe? Because everyone I know and everything I listen to says that it is this way. And so they can't be that way. So they must be crazy or they must be wrong or they must be brainwashed or, or, or any number of things. And it, and it prevents us from communicating with each other. The entire U.S. government fundamentally is based on the idea of compromise and negotiation. It's designed that way. But when you create a, a universe where each side thinks that they have the absolute answer and there is no way to communicate or talk through problems, the government doesn't function very well. And then that leads to people going, look, the government doesn't work, which makes it so I'm not going to participate, which makes it even worse. I mean, we're in this sort of devolving circle of anger and recriminations and uh, media bubbles where we just sort of live in our own information. And, uh, and it's making an angry, hostile and difficult society all around us.
And with those words, you can see where that can lapse into mental mm -hmm. health issues, as was brought up by the American Psychological Association. You know, as Lincoln said something a very long time ago, obviously, he says, I don't like that man. I got to get to know him better. <laughs> and why, too bad we got away from that. The wisdom, right? Too bad. It's like to use an old Buffalo Springfield song, battle lines are being drawn, you know. Mm -hmm. You're a hundred percent right. And, and, you know, the, the irony is that there are plenty of stories for those of us that study American government of politicians from our history where they would fight like cats and dogs on the floor of the house and then they go for dinner and, you know, and that they're, they're yeah, um, because it wasn't having a different view on how to solve difficult public issues wasn't considered wrong or evil where, where today uh, it's just uh, either you agree with me. Or, or you want, you know, something really awful to happen. And uh, and that's a, I don't know how, how one works in that particular kind of environment, unless, you know, we show, and I, I hate to say it, going back to the poll, but we show a little empathy. So true. So true. You know, as we're getting close to the end here, we got four or five minutes left on, on the clock here of the show. Uh, do you see sense of, Ambil ambivalence towards political elections also bleeding out into uh, tr public trust of yeah. our democracy, our system of courts, our systems of education, uh, you know, everything that we told dear near to this country. Yeah, I, I do. And I, and I think that troubles me a great deal. Um, increasingly, we, we sort of have, a, you know, the, the, the way it used to work is if you use, if you lose an election, um, the, the, the appropriate response is to do a sort of analysis of how you didn't manage to convince enough people to vote for you and adjust yourself and run for the next one. But now, you know, increasingly politicians across the spectrum believe that failure to win is, uh, you know, they got cheated or there's something wrong with the structure or, or, uh, or the government is, is illegitimate. And, uh, and that's troubling because fundamentally the stability of our democracy is, 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 is paramount to anything that we want to do. And, uh, and seeing the, you know, one of the troubling things to me is seeing how politics spills over into our sort of everyday assessment of each other, um, which is really troubling. I mean, I, you know, you, you see studies and research now suggesting that, for example, people in one political party don't want to date people in another political party. I gotta be honest with you, you know, back when I was in college, I don't think I asked a girl what her political party was, uh, but um, but you can see how that 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 ident political identity and absolutism with political identity and lack of empathy for anyone outside your political identity is really negative uh, in your life and also in our political structure. Well, you can see then how this seeps down into the American psyche Political Science Quarterly had a recent article, a great one, and I'm, I'm not going to get into it, just the title, Rethinking Political Polarization. And it's a, it's a phenomenal look. But the leaders that we all look at, state, local, federal, mm -hmm. in they're in this, this polarization uh, mode, it it's seeps down to everybody. And if you don't have the empathy, if you don't if you're not willing to talk, as we discussed a little while ago, if 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 you're if you're gonna see who you're gonna date based on a political party, you know this this has to affect the mindset of everybody. And as we indicated earlier, it went from 52 percent to 60 some odd percent. It's probably gonna get worse this year. Yeah. And and uh, I hate to see where it's gonna go because really, as Americans, we all need to coagulate. We all need to get together. And and you know that that, that may sound a little. Uh, uh, cliche-ish perhaps, but we've done it before and we still held our differences. There's something different now and it's, it's, it's seeping in to the mindsets of all parties, you know, of all people, whatever they believe in to a point where respect has gone out the window. Yeah. This intolerance. I, I, as a veteran, military veteran, as a retired law enforcement, David is, man, I just, I find it so difficult to, to swallow, right? How, how my brothers, my sisters, neighbors can just be into so intolerant of everyone else, right? And it's their shape, their opinion, or their their lack of trust is based on what they're hearing. And often what they're hearing is misinformation. Um, can you imagine how difficult it must be for cops, police officers on the street who never asked 
a person that calls for help. If you're a Republican or Democrat, what party and you know ideology do you do you subscribe to? They just went to take care of them. But can you imagine how difficult it must be for them when when the public is so polarized, or even the law enforcement members of law enforcement are equally as polarized in ideology? Man, that's so difficult, so complex. Where do we go from here, Doctor? We have about a minute left. Well, give us some good, <laughs> some good news. words, if you will. It's a Friday. <laughs> well, I, I think the the you know the you know it's, it says the old uh, Shakespearean uh, the fault is not in the stars it's in ourselves um, it's a recognition one what kind of information are we consuming and are we being you know to to look at ourselves a little bit and say are we being open to the ideas that you know or at least listening to the ideas that other people have rather than just repeating our own over and over again and also to recognize that you know the if somebody has a different viewpoint from mine. Um, we can discuss that viewpoint civilly. So we have to engage. We have to change the tenor uh, in our history. And, and I, I know you both know this, that, that we've, we've had some big struggles uh, across the, the, the history of the United States. And, uh, and we've, we, one thing that has been consistent is we've always managed to pull ourselves together as a people, as a country, and as a nation, and to deal with the difficult times that we faced and uh, to overcome them. And so I have faith that America will, will manage, that we'll figure this out. We must go through our struggles in order to get back on track. Um, on that note, Doctor, we'd love to have you on a future show. We'd love to discuss Anytime. more in detail with other participants. Uh, to the audience, thank you. Our producer, Rachel, behind the scenes, thank you so much. Millers, Michael Miller, Grant Miller, Community News team, we can't thank you enough to the audience. Thank you equally, if not more. Look us up on Spotify, YouTube. We're now on social media. We're now on most major podcast platforms under The Silent Struggle, hosted by military and police veterans. With that note, we'll say thank you. We'll see you next time.